Study Cat for schools. Today's session is on Minds on Learning and I'm going to be pulling from the four pillars of the science of learning and looking at quite a few things. So what are we doing today? We're going to look at three things. We're going to look at the four pillars of the science of learning. Now, there's lots of different pillars, okay? so. This might not be the pillars you've heard before, but these are sort of the ones that have been put forward by, I'll, I'll explain who. We're going to have a little bit of a deep dive into some research on active minds on learning. And then I'm going to spend the last part looking at some educational apps, not just the study cut apps, and we're going to, together, we're going to analyze them based on the four pillars of the science of learning. And it's going to be fun. I think we'll take about 55 minutes today. I'm not quite sure, a bit under an hour. I don't want to keep everyone up late. But the people who are in Portugal, lucky you. Oh, you're from Portugal in the UK. But first, let's play a game. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to show you a game from an app. This is not my company's app. It's from a company called Kids uh, Kidlo, Kidlo, and it's a coding app, a coding app. So it's very popular now to have apps that promote um well, it depends if you stay till the end. It all depends if you stay till the end. Anyway, you should come to the webinars to learn things, not just to get certificates, but you do get a certificate. Um, I'm going to show you an app now, and, um, and I want you to just have a look at it, and I want you to think about three things, uh, four things, actually. I want you to think how engaging is the activity, how much thinking is needed to play the activity is there anything meaningful is there any meaningful learning and is there any social interaction okay yeah i i, I understand tatiana it's every week but it's okay so let's have a look okay so you're going to answer these questions and i'm going to show you an app and i'm going to make the screen bigger boom oh and i'm going to turn it up so this is from a coding app, guys. So I want you to think. Okay, let's do this one. Let's do the tank. Might be a bit loud, right? Let me just... Okay, so there's a tank here and there's a monster here. Hmm, what do I have to do? I'm going to go forward, 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 shoot, go. Ah. Okay, I did okay. Next one. Ooh, I think I have to turn. I think I have to turn. Oh. I have to. Oh, sorry about that, guys. The camera's getting a bit bumped here. So I've got to turn. Okay, you see down here, I've put it, oh, can you guys see? Yeah, it's come down here. Then I'm going to go forward, forward, shoot. Okay, I'm going to do two more for you, okay? Ooh. All right, I'm going to turn, turn, shoot. Let me see. Ah, uh, no, I didn't do very well. Let me try one more time. Turn, turn, forward, shoot, forward, 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 shoot. Mm, let me try. Ah, oh, no, that didn't work. Okay, one more time. Turn, turn, shoot, forward, 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 shoot. Okay, you get the idea, right? So, there's a reason I'm showing you this app, guys.
Okay, awesome. No worries, guys. I don't think we should be discussed. Don't worry about it. You'll definitely get the certificates, okay, guys? All good. Um, so, guys, in that activity, you had you saw what I had to do. There was something on the screen, and I had to code in what would happen. So let's ask ourselves, do you think it was engaging? Yes or no? Was it engaging? Just tell me, yes or no? Okay, fine. It was engaging. Do you think much thinking was needed? Was there much thinking involved? <laughs> no, someone said no. Well, look, I'm 44 and I couldn't do it very well. Erica thinks no. Some people said definitely. Yeah, for younger, right? So what age group do you think this was aimed at? What age group do you think it was aimed at? Yeah, Chairman, actually, I think it is aimed at like five to six, they say. So that kind of beginning level, okay. And then was there much meaningful learning? Now, we're going to go all through this again, but was it very meaningful? I'm 43. I think that's right, yeah. I always get confused. Do you think it was very meaningful? Oh, yeah, Paul, it's aimed at 43 years. Yeah, it's, it, the hard question for this one is, how meaningful is it for the kid? Because did they really relate to it? Do they really want to drive a tank? I don't know, but somewhat meaningful, yeah. And then the last one was, was there any social interaction? Yeah, Tatiana, I would say no, right? None. So no social interaction happening on that app. Now, I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm just saying that just be aware of that. So that's going to be the premise of everything we're going to look at. Ooh, Tatiana, yes, you're starting to get the point, right? Maybe if the parents were sitting there with them, there would be some sort of social interaction, but there's not much going on there. If it was on a screen with other kids, maybe. So that's very interesting. Let's keep going. So that's really what we're going to do there. We're going to be looking at that. A lot of what we're doing today, guys, is coming from a kind of fast becoming one of my heroes is Dr. Kathy Hirsch Pasek. I highly recommend you look up her website, um, look at her books. She did the book, which I've talked about before, on um, Einstein didn't use flashcards. Her expertise is early education, uh, language learning, and uh, early education, language learning, screen time, and fun and play, play through learning. I, I think she's quite impressive. And a lot of what we're doing today comes from a paper that she wrote called Putting the Education into Education Apps and looking at the four pillars of the science of learning. So check out Hirsch Pasek, very interesting lady. Hey, Sylvia Lisette Estrada Leon de Cachon. Thanks for the suggestions. Good to see you. What time is it? It's 8 a.m. in the morning for once. It's not the middle of the night for you. Or 6 a.m., yeah. Okay, so what are the four pillars of the science of learning? Can anyone remember? Did anyone watch my video? Oh, active learning was one, yep. Now, look, there's many, many people have lots of different pillars. I'm just using the ones that she talks about, and I think these are interesting. So... Yeah, so we already looked at them, active learning, social interaction. Thinking is active learning really, oh, well, yeah, it is a bit, of, it is really active learning. What else? There was two more. A word that means, is it going to keep me interested and on task? Okay, I'm going to give them to you now. Let's have a look. Okay, so what do you think this one is, guys? What's this one? Yeah, nice one, active learning, excellent. Okay, what about this one? Yep, nice one, Tatiana's very good today. Yeah, meaningful learning, right? This one is meaningful learning. Okay, and then the next one, social interaction, very good, social interaction. And what about this one? What do you think this one says? Something of the something, something. Something in the something, something. Yeah, Maria. So, of course, you know that because, you know, you guys can all speak English 
and you found there. So actually this little activity is an active learning activity. But these four things are what we're going to look at. We're looking at, these are what um, Hirsch Pasek talks about as the four pillars of the science of learning, which have been adopted by many governments around the world as sort of like, and in psychology, this is what they talk about as the four pillars of the science of learning are, is it active learning? Is it meaningful? Is there engagement? And is there social interaction? Well, I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about them so you really understand what they are. And my goal today is that every time you go back into your classroom or create an activity or look at an app or go back in and into an online class, you just have these in the back of your mind and you think, is this active? Is it meaningful? Is it, is it social? Is there engagement? So let's have a look. So I'm going to talk for a bit now, okay? Uh, active learning means that the learner plays an active minds-on, which is what we're going to talk about, minds-on role in the knowledge-building activity. Now, this is the one I want to talk about the most, so I'm going to do it last, okay? So I'm going to do the minds-on learning last. The next one is engagement. Now, engagement doesn't just mean it's fun. Engagement means the ability to stay on task. So don't think of engagement just meaning how fun is this? It's are the learners staying on task without distraction? Now, anyone who has kids knows that distraction is, is an enemy to getting things done, right? My daughter will always find an excuse, a distraction to not keep on her homework or keep on finishing a task. So engagement is reinforced by extrinsic and intrinsic motivation, which you can look at another webinar I've done on, meaningful feedback, like people telling you you've done well or not done well and, and really valuing what you're understanding, how well you're going, and with few unimportant in interruptions. Now, I say unimportant means few distractions from around you that do not enhance the overall learning experience. Okay, so engagement is about staying on task. Hello from Ukraine. So... When we're thinking about engagement, don't think, are they having fun? Think, is this activity keeping my students on task? Is it in, are they involved in it enough that they know what to do and they're focused on this task and finishing the task? A really interesting one about distraction, a great bit of research I read last week, says what percentage of adults can text message and drive effectively without cognitive overload, meaning it's going to affect their task. So what percentage do you think can drive and it won't affect them? <laughs> well, actual 10, 0, 0. Now, what else we got? I'm sure some, yep, just, it'll be definitely just Peter Somerville. Anna Hasper, 21%. Actually, you got, I think uh, Erica and Dave were a lot closer, 2%. That they say that these guys are called super taskers. There's a very, very, very small amount of people in society, two or less than 2% of people, can actually multitask, can actually do one thing, have a distraction going, and be able to do both. And then once you get to a third thing, the cognitive overload means you're pretty much over. All of us think we can multitask. None of us can multitask. So, for example, when you see people on their phone walking down the street, if they're messaging, you watch how slowly they walk. They pretty much, it's almost like they're bumping into people or they don't notice you coming at them just because they're on their phone. That's because there's two tasks trying to happen at the same time. So just keep this in mind. This is what engagement is about, that they're engaged on the text messaging, so how can they possibly know where they're walking, right? And it's the same with kids. If, you're, if you've got distractions happening around them, how can they be keeping on the task? But it's more than that. So engagement is about keeping students on task and distraction becomes the enemy of that engagement, right? So if even if kids are playing with toys, they know, research shows, if just the TV is on, they'll get distracted from playing with their own toys. So this is something they want to do. They want to play with their own toys. And then the TV is playing something in the background as interesting as Peppa Pig, and then boom, Peppa Pig is now the distraction. So that means that they don't keep on the game that they're playing. So even when they're as motivated as playing their own games. So you can imagine when we have, especially with uh, app building and educational um, design and learning design, you've got to think about 
how can I keep them so engaged in this task that they're going to want, they have to keep moving towards a goal and they're not getting distracted by all the other things? Let's have a look at this though. In educational apps, we, when we're building them, um, we avoid distractions, right? That The old style app back in about 10 years ago, lots of things happening everywhere. But the new wave of apps is all about avoiding those distractions and keeping learners going on the task. So in the game we just played, you, and we'll analyze a few more. Yeah, simplicity, but you'll see in a minute, right, when we get back to active learning, it needs to be not simple as well. So we need them to avoid distractions and keep learners on task through sh on task through short motivating activities. And you know when you see these little hands pop up on an app if you have children, that's about keeping the kids on task. That's not necessarily helping them play the game. It's just reminding them or a little thing that says tap, 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 tap. You might hear that in an app. That's about keeping them to get back onto the task. That's what we, and it's a really big thing in education labs is how do we get that them back on task? But we'll be having a look at a few more, okay? So has anyone ever played this game here on the left? I'm sure you've all played it before. Yeah, Ekaterina, I'm sure you have. Everyone has really probably. And I think it's like there's millions of them. What this one is, it's highly active, which we'll talk about later, very busy. There's You're getting points over here and then there's something happening here and then there's all these things you can win here and there's lots of things happening. Well, it's great to keep people um, having fun and they want to keep playing but it doesn't necessarily help with learning. So there's this real balance in the difference between an educational app, which is just get, get, get me that big cat, is like move this cat over to here. This one's from um, Cambridge, I think. But the idea, yeah, so if we want to keep cognitive challenge in a simple way, avoid, yeah, but simple layout to avoid distraction. Exactly. Anna. And that's what the big movement is to, to, to moving away from um, shapes and, sorry, three-dimensional and moving into flat design and more white space in, in educational design because it keeps people focused on what they've got to do. So in this one, it's definitely a learning app. This one might be super fun, but you might not learn that much, right, because there's just too much going on. It just never stops, right? So when we're designing educational apps, just we, we think about the difference between the balancing app between is it an actively engage is it engaging, but also and keeping them on task, but also is it active and challenging, which I'll show you in the active part in a minute. Okay, so that was all about engaging learning. Okay. The next pillar is meaningful learning. Meaningful learning allows the learner to connect to new material. Um, sorry, to connect new material to existing knowledge and experiences, right? While uh, having a purpose to apply what they've learned. So there needs to be a reason that you want to learn this thing. So in the app we just watched, well, why am I making a tank go along? Now, it might be fun, but I don't know how meaningful that is unless I then start doing computer coding. So this is a really difficult way to say it. I'll say it in two ways, the simple way and the difficult way. So Brown, is, which is a, worth looking up his research, it talks about people who can learn to extract the key ideas from the new material and organize them into a mental model and then connect that model to a prior model or prior knowledge, right, show an advantage to learning com, um, complex mastery. So in other words, connect what you're learning now to something you already know. Um, connect personally to the learning. And I will continue. So we know that in meaningful learning, something like rote learning, where we're just like in a lot of language teachers do it, just flashcard after flashcard after flashcard. Yeah, it, it helps you learn it in the short term, preparing for a test. But as we know, it's very shallow understanding. So just, I'm not going to go into this today. Oh, we've dropped out, haven't we? seems like I've dropped out. <laughs> it just told me I've dropped out. I'll keep going. So, guys, I won't get into this one too much because I've just done a, um, a webinar on it and we're going to have another one from Ross Thorburn coming up. But 
obviously with meaningful learning, it's all about things like setting context, personalizing the learning, you know, don't just learn the colors, ask them what their favorite color is, it's that simple. Opinion questions, add meaningful learning, make sure it's relevant to the learner, you know, make sure I, I know why I'm learning this and make sure it's culturally specific culturally specific, especially us language teachers, if you're a language teacher. But that's another whole webinar. So I'm going to go past that one quickly. Next is social interaction. I think this one's quite amazing, actually. Social interaction allows the learner to interact with others in high quality ways around the learning experience to apply the knowledge and gain meaning. So the one we just saw on the app was, well, it was kind of cool because they could do something on their own, but there wasn't much social interaction. If it was social interaction, it might be they're designing something on their app and it's and then it's controlling something on the other person's app, or there's two people talking to each other in the app and they've got to work out how to go, or they're talking about it as they're playing. So let's go on. I really like this one, right? So when, when young children were... So nine-month-old infants succeeded in learning only when the task, so this task of showing them a new thing, what they call like a novel event, so a new piece of language or a new thing. So this is a pen, right? Nine-month-old infants succeeded in learning only when this task included the presentation of a face looking at the stimuli, the, the, the pen, and with a voice saying, Hi, baby, look at this. They failed at the same task without the support. So when there was a mum or someone saying the word to them and saying, look at this, the child was more likely to remember it or exceeded learning, succeeded in learning in it than if it was just like on a TV screen or something, right? There wasn't a face involved. And it's absolutely fascinating. So there's, the research is here. If you look it up, and I'm going to send a, a whole paper when I attach this, um, really a lot of research at that young age, how interesting it is, that the, how much the social interaction and the face. Um, another one, you know, I mean, we all know this guy. I, I mention this guy in nearly every single, every single webinar I do, I mention Vygotsky because I really think, you know, he, he just got it before everyone else. Um, and then everyone else has been copying him ever since. But according to Vygotsky, the social dialogues that preschoolers engage in are crucial for advancing their cognitive development. So a lot of people think that going to school is all about going into the classroom, but what, it, what most educators know is that so much of the learning happens outside the classroom from that social interaction. And one more, um, two more things to show you is the recent work has pointed to the natural, they call it the natural give and take that happens in face-to-face -face interaction. That there's, there's a lot of um, links now between learning and this, what happens in the face-to-face -face interaction. And here's the interesting part, because it's COVID-19 times, and I'm sure all of you are teaching online at the moment. The interesting part is that this social interaction, um, when the social interaction was established in an online format or in an electronic format, because this was 2014, via Skype or a similar live chat video, children learned equally well from real person and a digitally and from a real person and a digitally live on-screen interaction. So if I'm talking to you like this, it's equal to standing in front of someone. Now look, this was 2014 and we don't know. Maybe after the 2020 COVID-19 or COVID-19 that happened in 2020, maybe we'll see there's, there's going to be amazing amount of research coming out in 2021, I'm sure, like talking about this. So maybe this will be proven wrong. But the point is the fact that it was a face-to-face -face interaction and they could still see what was happening helped with the learning, which I think is absolutely fascinating. Um, yeah, <laughs> as we're all doing that now. Okay, so that was all the stuff before that. I better speed up. This is going to be about active learning now. So that was three so far. We've had engaging, uh, social, meaningful, and now active. So active learning, as I said, means that learners play an active minds-on role in knowledge-building activity. So let's have a look at this.
this is a great little example of how it works. So what's this? Cat and, yep, yeah. and this one? Yeah, 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 you're right, great. And this one? Yep, yeah. zebra and horse, right? Of course. Now, this doesn't seem hard at all, right? And this one? Ooh, who can spell well? This one? Chimpanzee and Bonobo, right? So they're, they're just similar pairs of things. Cat, dog goes together, kind of, right? Rabbit and hare, that's two types of rabbit type of thing. I don't know what they're called. Um, a zebra and a horse, two type of equine animals. And a chimpanzee and a Bonobo, they're both, um, they're both apes, right? Now, this is, this is the interesting part. Apparently... If you give people those two pairs of things, of words, doesn't have to be those ones, but if you give, uh, research has shown that if you give people these pairs of words with some letters missing, you're more likely to remember it than if I'd just given them to you like this. So if I had just given them to you without the missing letters, you are less likely to remember. And if you have the missing letters, you're more likely to remember. I think that that's... It really, so that's this, and that came from if, if adults are presented with a word in a word pair, which one of the words has a few letters missing and they're asked to generate the full word, they will remember the pair better than if passively reading it. So, um, yeah, Anna, I like that term. And, I mean, this is from research from Hirschman and Bjork, 1988. You can look it up. You can download the paper. It's quite interesting. But it, it seems so obvious, right? But it's just like the idea that the, the task was... To, the goal, the language learning goal was to learn these words, but the minds on part was the fact that there were some letters missing. So I had to just quickly think about what they would be. What do you think is minds on here? What am I trying to talk about here? Who is really, yeah, because they need to be conscious. Excellent, Julieta. What am I talking about here? What is minds on about this picture? What might I be referring to? Erica, Terry, ooh, be present mentally, okay, interaction. Okay, think about it. What's this? Is this a, ooh, Anna Hasper always comes in with the big answers. The student as the teacher. Yes, very good job, Anna Hasper. So, guys, as Anna has put forward here, the students are teaching, right? So what's minds on about the students teaching? What would be minds on about it? What would be active learning about that? And you probably have to type, yeah, you get, your mind is on a task because, so the research shows, I'll just elaborate a bit here, but the research shows that, really interesting, I thought, I didn't know this, right? Yeah, learning from a peer. Who said that? Christina Franca, yeah. That we know that kids learn from peers really, really well, but also, which is the social interaction side. But here it is. Another study examined college students who were instructed to learn material with the expectation of teaching it to another child, right, to another student. So it was, I'm going to learn this, but in the back of my mind, I'm thinking I have to teach this after. So there's two tasks going on. One is learning the content and the other one is thinking about, which is the minds on part, how am I going to then teach this on? So because there was two things happening, they had to put, yeah, they had to go deeper than just understand and memorize, just understand, yeah. So having to teach puts students in a more active minds on mindset for learning the material. So just by getting two kids in your class and saying, you're going to learn this and you're going to learn this, and now I'm going to make you swap over and teach each other is a great way to, to apply some of the pillars of science of learning and get that minds on learning happening. So subjects who learned in order to teach were more intrinsically motivated because they're worried about themselves, right? And in my past webinars, I love the concepts of intrinsic motivation. And they had a higher conceptual learning scores and were more actively engaged than the students who just learned to be examined, examined, sorry. So, and, you know, it's such a wonderful little 
bit of research there. And this is from way back in um, 1984. And remember, I, I often talk about Desi, who, who is really one of the first guys who, who talks about intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. He does the cube tests. Check out Desi the cube test. Very interesting as well. Oh, and it's also backed up by another guy, the one of the fathers of uh, flipped learning approach, Eric Mazur from Harvard University, who's a really interesting guy too. Okay, so another one with minds on is like the idea of minds on reading, right? So minds on reading is rather they've shown evidence shows, and I want I haven't got the links to the research here, but when you're reading. If you read to the kids and the kids are sitting back passively listening, they're less likely to remember the story than if you're stopping, asking questions, telling them, asking them about things that they might want to know, trying to find a picture in there, um, stopping and getting them to guess what might be the next word just by doing all those things around reading. And, I'll do, and I have another webinar on that. I don't want to get into it now. But, the, you know, so much research shows that, if you're actively involved in the reading process with the teacher, you're going to learn more about what you were reading, okay? So just keep that in mind when you're reading to kids, get them involved in the process. Okay, and there's just two more I wanna go on here and then we'll look at some apps. So when five to six year old children, okay, this is about learning vocabulary, right? So when five to six year old children actively manipulated an object, like they picked it up, while hearing a new label, which just means hearing the name of that word, and then heard that label again, neuroscience has shown that motor areas of their brains were more likely to be activated upon subsequent viewing compared if they were only allowed to passively watch that new word. So basically, if they could touch something, they learned it better. Very, very simple. But we've shown that neuroscience scans and stuff has shown that this is what's happening. And guess what? You're all at home now and you're all teaching kids who are at home so they can always pick something up, right? If I'm learning bottle, pick up the bottle. Just touching the bottle makes them learn that word more, especially with language learning, than if they hadn't touched something, if they just seen you doing it. Just touching something changes how well they learn, okay? Because it's minds on. They've got to be – they're thinking about it in a different way. Last one. Oh. Another really great one, sorry, I'm telling you too many, was after kids do an experiment, so this was actually done in middle schools, they would do a science experiment, and then the, then the researchers would just say, now draw the experiment. Kids who drew the experiment after outperformed those who didn't draw the experiment, who so just did the experiment. So you would think hands-on learning, but this is the point. There's a difference between hands-on and minds-on. Hands-on means I'm doing it. Minds on means I've got to really push myself to think about what happened in that experiment, right? So after they're like drawing it means, oh, I've got to think, how did that happen? How am I going to draw it? A bit of creativity. So just by drawing an experiment, the kids remember the experiment better than if they just did the experiment. I think that's fascinating. And the last, uh, one more, just a quick one is obviously students who stop, start, rewind and repeat videos do better than ones who just watch the videos. So who knows where this video is from? Very famous man. Yeah, I, Yolanda, I'll, I'll try and drop them all into the onto the website. I'm sure you guys can guess where this comes from. Yeah, Khan Academy. Well done, Erica Kaim. So, I mean, Khan Academy has really shown, they've got so much evidence that people who stop and start, rewind, do better than if you just watch it and try to remember it. Same with note-taking. If you take notes, you do better if you write them than if you type them because your mind it's more minds-on. Last one I'll say about minds-on learning is active learning also benefits vocabulary learning. So when three-year-old children figured out the referent of a novel label, it just means a new word, through a process of elimination, they, they showed better retention than if they were just told that word, okay? Oh, thank you. Um, so I just want to show you an example from my classes. In, in my classes with the very, very young kids, you would start by saying red, yellow, blue, right? And they're learning it, red, yellow, blue. And then they remember blue, yellow, red. So the kids have learnt the colours. And then I'm going to show them this. It's a ball, right? 
So red, yellow, blue, and then I'm going to show them a ball, right? Very, very simple. And what I see most teachers do then, they'll put this up on the screen or in the class, and they'll say, it's a ball. But the key for Minds on Learning is to present them this ball and get them to make the connection. Oh, this is a ball, and this is yellow, so this is a yellow ball. Now it seems so simple, but just getting them to make that connection between it's a yellow ball and you don't tell them, they're much more likely to have the retention of that word. Yep, easy one. Okay, let's just do a really quick game, guys. Do you think, I'm just going to read what these are, and do you think it's minds on? So it's really activating the mind or it's minds off, not much is going on. So let's do an easy one first. Okay, drawing the new words you've learned. Minds on or minds off? Yeah, I think it's on, okay. Taking notes by hand, on or off? Yep, yeah, on. Drawing, doing a puzzle, doing a puzzle. Yeah, on, okay. Tapping on a tablet, tap, 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 tap. Yeah, it's pretty off, right? Not much is happening when you're tapping. You're not doing anything. Uh, flashcard drills, when you're holding up flashcards and getting kids just to say the words. Yeah, not much happening there, right? It's just repeat. I don't have to do much. I just look at it. Apple, 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 apple. It's an apple. A gap fill. This is an interesting one. What about a gap fill? Yeah. So people are quite down on gap fills, but they do involve some sort of thinking. Peer teaching. Yeah, we just did that one. So using a video could be good, could be bad, could be both, right? Who knows what, what's CLIL? Yeah, on, off, good one. What's CLIL? This question's for Dave Weller. No, Paul, no, Peter Somerville. Anna Hasper, yeah, content language integral. Oh, Shirley Norris, Shirley Norris, congratulations. I think that this will be quite minds-on, right, because you do, usually in CLIL you're doing a task and the language is happening around it, so you're quite minds-on thinking. Um, that's it, really. I just wanted to have a look at these for you. So I, I sort of grouped them up like this. So I think of it on a scale. And then whenever I, we, you're doing something, try to choose things that there are more down this end, or sorry, which end is it? This end of the scale, right? Choose things that are more down this end of the scale. Okay, let's go on. So when we're designing apps, I'm, actually I'm going to skip that. I've got one more thing to add because I want to get to the fun part with the apps before we wrap up. What's this? Well, I talk about this very often, so we don't need to go on about it, right? It's a building, yep. Ekaterina, yeah, Tatiana, it's scaffolding, right? And you all know what scaffolding is. I really like this definition. Scaffolding is a pedagogical structure that helps guide children or learners to accomplish a task that would not be able to accomplish by themselves, right? It's a stairway, yeah, that's right. Well done, Peter. Um, what, what, I just need to add this because what they talk about is the four pillars of learning and then they add scaffolding on, as if if there's no scaffolding with those pillars, then there's there's no learning goal. So we talk, they, a lot of research now shows that actually direct instruction does do better than free play, even though free play is what we think is, you know, Montessori, and I've talked about it a lot, a lot of open free play will allow learning to happen, but actually, so research is starting to show that they both do okay, but direct instruction does a little bit better. And guided discovery, where you're sort of pushed along with that play, but you're discovering something on the way, so it's still quite, there's some sort of support from an adult in some way, does better overall. Um, so this idea of scaffolded exploration is that for app building, when we're building apps, and that's what we do here at StudyCat, we build educational apps, for certain types of apps, external scaffolding can transform children's experience from relatively haphazard poking and swiping, which we're going to have a look at, to a more guided experience, okay? So I want to go, let's look at some apps now. Let's have a bit of fun. But when we're looking at the apps, um, I'm going to use this rubric, okay? So the rubric is what we've been talking about. Again, is it active? Is there an engagement? 
Are they on task? Is there lots of distractions? So remember, engagement doesn't mean fun. It means are they on task? Is there meaningful learning happening? Is there a reason why I'm learning it? Is it social? And is there any scaffolding? So the last one, the one we just saw, the, the coding one, there's a lot of scaffolding. You had activity one was move once. And then the next one, move three times. And the next one gets a little bit harder. So lots of scaffolding there and quite active, I think. So let's have a look um, at, this is my next one. This is the Tokaboka Hair Salon. Okay, so we're going to have a look at this one. The Tokaboka Hair Salon. I just need to go back here and click on Tokaboka. And I'm going to open this up. Oh, this app has to go up this way. Okay, and I'm going to turn it back up. Oh, sorry, guys. Uh, okay. Can you see this? Okay, let's have a look. We'll look what happens in this app. Can I turn it this way? No, unfortunately not. So maybe, sorry, guys. I was going to put it like this so I can show you. Sorry about that. Can you see it now, guys? Yeah. So this is from probably the most famous app building company in the world, Tokaboka, well, for kids. And I'm going to just play, okay? Oh. So I've got to cut her hair. Mm. Oh, now I'm going to, I don't know what I'm going to do now. I'm going to dye her hair. Oh, yeah, I'm going to put something on her face. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and now oh, I'm going to shave her head. Yeah, and now I'm going to, uh, what else can I do? Oh, I'm going to shave a bit of her head here, and now I'm going to brush her hair. Oh, that looks awesome. Now I'm going to blow dry it. Woo! Blow dry. And, okay, she's done well, and then I'm going to brush her hair a bit. Oh, oh I'm going to go back. Okay, oh, I've got to wash her hair now. Yay, lots of things I can do in this, right? And then we'll dry it again. Awesome. No, and she's got a bleeding nose, the poor girl. I didn't mean that. Sorry. And you can have this. Okay, but I can't move on again. There you go. Okay. <laughs> All right, I thought that was quite fun. So that's called the Tokoboka Hair Wrap. Now, uh, I think it's called Hair Salon. Now, let's have a look at it from the point of view of an educational value. I want you to tell me how much active learning was happening there, right? How much active learning was happening there? Tell me. Well, let's say low, medium, or high. They had to do something. I had to think about it a little bit. Okay, you guys are saying low? Okay, so I'm going to put low, okay? So I'll colour in this square, low, okay? Okay. How engaging was it? How, how on task would you be if you were a child? Okay. Low, medium, high. Okay, what are we going to have? I'm going to see what most people say. Okay, we'll go, we'll go for, we'll go for it, was, uh, it was quite engaging. Um, how meaningful was it? Oh, you thought it was quite meaningful? Oh, no, low. Yeah, I thought it was quite low when it came to meaning, right, because... I don't know. Or, yeah, and then, sorry, there's one thing I didn't tell you. You can actually take a photo of it and then send it to a friend. So how social was it? Yeah, maybe medium, low, I don't know. Maybe if kids are doing something together. And then for scaffolding, I would say it's here. There's just no scaffolding. There's no – it doesn't get harder. There's no goal or anything, right? So this is this – is, these apps are called sandbox apps, and they just mean – you go in and play on them, and there's some sort of learning happening, I guess. You're manipulating something. They, they would actually argue this is quite active because you're not just tapping. You actually have to move something over. There is some cognitive sort of process happening. Yeah, Tatiana, oh, okay, I, I, you've, you've seen my hair, so you can see why it wasn't very good, right? Uh, anyway, I'll continue. I, this is what I gave it. I actually think it's highly active, but this is just me, guys. I'm not, I'm not the guru on all of this stuff, but I think it was highly active because you have to do this to cut the hair, and then you've got to move this to blow the hair, then you've got to find this over here. And I thought it was kind of kept to engaging, 
maybe meaningful because you can create your own colors, your own styles, but it doesn't, um, yeah, exactly. But it's not social and there's no learning happening. There's no real point. So let's go to the next one. That was just that one. Okay, the next one was this one. This is a very famous phonics app called Starfall. Let me just show you this one quickly. I want to show you two more before we go because I'm obviously going to show you StudyCat as well. So in this one, same process, very, very famous app. Build, uh, app. Um, we'll just choose a letter. Peter Somerville, choose a letter. Or anyone in the UK. M, done. Ekaterina one. Sorry, Peter. M. 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 Mm. Moon. Oh, Moon, where are you? Mm. Mm. Motorcycle. Mm. Oh, sorry, I bumped it. Okay, one more. I'll just do one more just to show you. Nothing happens. Mm. Masks. Oink, oink. Oink, oink. Mm. Make a match. Okay, and then you see there's more things happening now, I think. Okay, and I'll just play for one more one, second. Two. T, Q. Okay, you get it, right? M, Y, M, M, V, Q, T. Anyway. So anyway, let's just quickly uh, let's just quickly analyze this one because I would love to know what you guys think. Any active learning happening? Oh, okay. I it's interesting. I want to hear what people say. So active learning means, guys. Remember, there needs to be something cognitive happening. So all I had to do was press a button. That was it. I just tapped it. I mean, literally nothing. I didn't have to do anything. So there was, in, to be honest, there's no active learning on that app. Um, I'm not criticizing it, really. It's just, um, and then it shows me a, a moon, and then, um. So I was not, there's no way a child is cognitively engaged in that. So active means that. How about engaging? How do you keep them on task? Did you notice what it does to keep you on task? There's something quite interesting that the app does that keeps you on task. So there's a little arrow in the corner. Yeah, it's like it would, it would, there's a little arrow. So you, each game is very short, so only about 10 seconds, and then it has an arrow to move to the next one, and then 10 seconds, and then move to the next one. So that's a way that apps are designed to keep you engaged and on task. It's not very meaningful because it didn't really – do anything and then social known scaffolding maybe so I, I don't want to I don't want to rate this app because my advice my opinion is it's it was about here for active here for engaging here for meaningful not social and probably has some decent scaffolding like it's keep on going up I don't think it works it, when you start looking at it from the point of science of learning it doesn't really cover that very well I'm not but I've used Star 4 a million times in class. It's, you know, maybe I, should, maybe I can rethink that, okay? Um, I, I was going to show you some of the StudyCat app, and I think that it's worth it just to show you in a different way, but I, um, I'm not here just to market. I just wanted to show you some of it because some of it, I'll be honest, isn't great, so let's have a look. So, um, so this is from StudyCat for Schools. We're learning. I'll show you.
Dra. Uh, Dra. 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 Yeah. Dra. Let's play for one more. Thirty seconds. Oh. Drum. No. Drum. Oh, truck. Drum. Drink. Drum. Tram. Drum. Tree. Oh, I'm so good at this game. Okay, I was going to play one more game with you just to give you. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> There's so many different games, so it doesn't really. Uh. I'm just going to show you spelling because it was similar to the phonics game we just did. Bear. Bear. B. Hmm? B. E. R. A. B. E. A. R. Bear. Tiger. T. T. I. G. E. R. Tiger. Okay, and I'll just show, I'm just going to find one more random game here. Uh, oh, I know which one I can show you. I'll show you a quick level two pink. Uh, let me show you this one. Sorry. Here we go. Uh, oh. Welcome. Sorry, guys. One second. Painted red. 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 Painted blue. Blue. Painted yellow. Okay, so the first ones are easy. And then... Painted orange. Orange. White. No. Yellow. Uh, blue. No. Yellow. Red. Orange. Painted pink. Oh, pink. So I need two colors, right? Red, white, red, white, pink. Okay, you get it, right? So anyway, that's just three really quick games because I'm running out of time here. Um, so with – oh, and that was only on the small screen, right? So anyway, I, I'm not here just to say that ones are better than the other or anything like that. I just uh, think that when you're looking at apps – Try to look at it from a different perspective than just, is it fun, right? It's got to be, is it active? So I would say, honestly, with the Study Cat for Schools app, I do think they're quite active. There's lots of games where you've got to move things around. There's puzzle games. You've got to do matching games. There's things more than just tapping. Maybe they weren't good examples, but there's many things. It is engaging because it keeps them on task because they've got to finish. They're getting scores. But... There's not much chance for meaningful interaction or social um, social interaction unless you're letting them play together. But it's a, it's an aligned to Cambridge Young Learners, so there's a lot of scaffolding going through. As you saw in each activity, there it starts easy and then it gets harder and harder throughout the activity. Just adding some more scaffolding. Plus, it's part of a big course. So that's my bit about Study Cat for Schools, which you can always download and check out if you contact us on our website. So lucky last today was the kids coding app. And for me, I thought the first one, it was very active. You actually have to really think about, like I'm pressing this, but that's making that move. It's quite engaging. It keeps you on task. There's some scaffolding. But again, they're quite down here when it comes to meaningful or social. Oh, I want to see what Peter says. So, um, my point is today was to really highlight that the four pillars of science of learning can help you out in all your classes anyway. It applies to our classrooms as well. But when we're developing apps, we're thinking about all these things when we're developing into the apps. And the big step is going to see in apps is how we're we going to make them more social. Because it seems that people are starting to get the idea of what is active learning and what is good engagement. What is the scaffolding's okay in some places, but what we need to start seeing is how are we going to make them more social? How are we going to get kids to talk to each other in the apps, share things in the apps, have some more meaningful interaction in the apps? So 
that was everything I wanted to talk to you today about. Who can remember what they are? A quick test before we go. Don't go now, guys, because I've got one thing to show you at the end. What was this one in the corner? Top left-hand corner. Who can remember from the spatial? Yes, it was active learning. What was this one? The, the orange one, orange. Meaningful. Blue was... Blue was... Yeah, engagement in the learning process. And green was? Social. Boom. Congratulations, guys. Well done. I need you all to know this super cool thing coming up next week is the Study Cat Summit number one. And we really love to invite you all to come. You can sign up and register online. We have Dr. Adam Black. Dr. Adam Black is probably one of the world's leading experts in language, uh, sorry, educational data and how to use data for enabling quality insights in your classroom. Dr. Katarina Gospic is a neuroscientist who talks about, um, he's going to be talking about VR and AR and what can happen there. And Carl is a really experienced EOTEL publisher based in Greece, but lots of experience in how we can get people to move on from the old school textbooks into uh, new things. We've also got some panelists on there, some famous faces that you probably already have known. So sign up, be there, and... Um, Maybe some of you will be featured on some of these summits in the future. Um, check it out when you click the link. Have fun. Don't forget to come. It's going to be amazing. Looking forward to seeing you all at the 27th. Have a great day. 901 exactly. Boom. Always, guys, invite the principals. Yeah, invite everyone. Invite your principals. Invite your teachers. Invite your bosses. Tell everybody because these guys really are fascinating. It's going to be a fast paced, it's going to be presentation panel, presentation panel, and we'll host it here on Click Meeting. And remember, guys, check us out at studycat.com.